So uh, just want to uh, take a more of a thematic approach. I mean, it's very. I have to say that that uh, putting out the classic papers in a field is the best way to turn your friends into enemies. <laughs> and so I'm just. Uh, I'm. I'm going to take a particular stab at this, which has to do with the subfield called uh, physics-based vision. And so I want to. How many of you are students in the audience? Okay, great. So how many of you feel like you have to know convolutional neural networks? <laughs> Almost everybody. How many of you want to know convolutional <laughs> neural networks? See, that's about half. So, so in, this, in the next few minutes, I'm going to give you an out, meaning to say I'm going to give you an avenue to pursue, which might be a little bit different and make you feel like the world is a bigger place. That's my, that's my role. So I'm, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, the two worlds of vision. So this world that I show you here, which has to do with the applications of vision to virtual reality, gaming, the cars, driverless cars, security, space, etc. This is the world that we're all very familiar with. This is what I would call the glamorous world of vision. This is the world where all the supermodels live. That's all of you, pretty much all of you. And then there is the world where all the stuff that we use gets made. All the stuff that we use on a daily basis. And this is the underworld of vision. This happens, this happens under the ground, and you don't even know what's happening here. But I will tell you this. If this world did not exist, there would be hardly any interesting gadgets for you to play with. Uh, and, and all the sort of technological innovation that we have seen thus far would not be possible if not for this subfield of vision, which is called machine vision. right? And one might assume that the two worlds are pretty much the same in terms of methods and algorithms. I would argue that they're very different in the sense that here we talk about versatility. We talk about the word intelligence. So when we talk about deep learning and so on, we're trying to make things as versatile, as broad, as intelligent as possible. Of course, we need intelligence and machine vision as possible uh, as well. But at the same time, I think that the emphasis here is on precision, on reliability. So one might assume that this is easier than this, uh, not quite. What makes these two very different is the fact that typically here you get images from what we'll call normal sensors, cameras, and we have to recover information from those images. In this case, you can actually manipulate or engineer the images that are coming at you, meaning that you can develop new sensors to achieve what you're trying to achieve. In doing so, one might think that you're cheating in the sense that the problem has been made easier, but I would say that the bar is much higher. Where you might be interested in measuring things to centimeters here, you might have to go down to microns down here. Do you see what I mean? So it's a different game. And it is a game that you cannot play without embracing the most beautiful thing about vision, which is light. Right? It's very interesting to me that if you look at all the papers that are being published in CVPR and ICCV, the image is seen as a signal. And to me, what makes vision really interesting is the, the aesthetics of light, the beauty of light, the, the subtleties of light. Okay? So you have to embrace this for this particular aspect of vision, which I think is a wonderful thing. So, talking about light, one of the classic papers, which happens not to be a vision paper, but a very important paper was this one by Nicodemus back in 77, because when we started thinking about light in vision, we have to think about how to define various things. What is the brightness of a light source? What is the illumination of a surface? What is the reflectance of a surface? And this was the paper that came up with the definitions, the working definitions that we needed to define these quantities. Radiant intensity of a source, the irradiance or the illumination of a surface, that's this right here, and surface radiance. In fact, Nicodemus in 1963, the same year that Roberts wrote the paper on vision, Nicodemus wrote a paper called Radiance. That's a little bit like a philosopher writing a paper called Life. Right? Very, very broad. Think about that. The shorter your, by the way, the shorter your title is to your paper, the more impressive it is. That means you've, you've consumed a larger space. So that was Nicodemus back there. But with these, with these concepts, we could begin to think about things like reflectance. 
In fact, he introduced the concept of the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, which is what we call reflectance. In this particular example, you have uh, objects which have the same geometry, illuminated the same way, but they look very different because of their material properties. So to study in this field, we had to embrace material properties and the notion of reflectance. So this was all known in the applied optics or the domain of light. But uh, as, as uh, Takeo mentioned, it was really Horn, BKP Horn, who brought all of this to the vision domain, so to speak. So this is work by Horn and Schoberg, and it's the concept of reflectance map that Takeo talked about. And the reflectance map was a, was a representation that was particularly designed for vision. And what Horn and Schoberg were saying is that if you give me the material properties of a surface, and you tell me where the light source is, then I can create a map, R, that takes you from brightness to the orientation of the surface. So you give me a brightness 0.7, I plug it in here, and it might lie on a bias of brightness contour right here, but those are all the PQ values that would have generated that brightness of 0.7, right? This was the reflectance map um, representation. So I, brightness, is equal to R, PQ. Well, so with this in place, the next question that Ohan asked, which uh, Takeo also alluded to, is uh, the shape from shading question. If I give you the brightness at, at, a, at a particular point on the surface, can you tell me what the PQ value is, what the surface orientation is? Can we recover shape from a single image, right? Shape from shading. And so let's go back to the reflectance map. So here is a reflectance map. And if I give you this brightness value right here, then as we said earlier, it's likely to lie on an ISO brightness contour such as this one, which is telling us that there's an infinite set a continuum of PQ values that would produce the same brightness, and therefore shape from shading at a pixel level was simply not a, a tractable problem, a solvable problem. So it's interesting to me, and this was, this was around the time that I was a graduate student with Takeo, and what was interesting is that around the same time, in psychophysics, people were studying shape from shading as well. This is a classic paper by Ramachandran. Have you, have you seen this? Have you, do you know? How many of you know Ramachandran? You must read his papers. It's just beautifully written stuff. Where when, as you read the paper, you realize that the experiments are being conducted on the reader. <laughs> right? He just has an uncanny knack of simplifying things and, and, and conveying the point through. So Ramachandran had this beautiful paper, which I still use as a reference in my class sometimes on perceiving shape from shading and showing that we have to use additional constraints to solve the shape from shading problem. So here's an example from his paper. So let me just, now don't think too much about this, just your instinct. If you look at this piece on the left side, are these concave or convex bumps? Do they bump out or in? Out, right? How many of you say out? Most of you say out. Why is that? Because this on the right side is just the inverse of it. It's just the inverse. It's exactly the same shading. And this is, of course, in, right? How did we come to that in interpretation? Well, it turns out that we make the assumption that the light is above us. We live in a world where we have the sun. We walk around. The sun is above us. Light falls from above. And therefore, this is one of the assumptions that's being used to constrain the shape from shading problem. In fact, this is better conveyed with this example here. This is a picture by Rittenhouse, 1786. And of course, we see a mound here. And in the center of the mound, you'll see a little crater. And if I said, listen, if I flip this image upside down, what would you see? Well, you would expect to see a mound hang hanging upside down with a crater in the center, right? But if you do it, you actually see a crater with a mound in the center. Mm -hmm. And how did we come up with this interpretation? Because again, we are assuming that the light source is above us. So we understood from all of this that shape from shading is a hopeless problem, right? It's a ho it's a, there is this beautiful constraint in there, but there's only so far you can go with it. You need to throw more at the problem to solve it. And so the first attempt at doing that, there were many shape from shading, um, many shape from shading articles, but this one by Ikeuchi and Horn was, I would say, the first practical attempt at this which said, let's use additional constraints, the kinds of constraints that we use that have been shown to use in psychophysics as well. So the first constraint, of course, 
is that the image intensity value must equal to the reflectance map value. This is not even a, this is not even an assumption. It's just a constraint. And so you have to then take the difference of that at all pixels and you minimize that error. So if you sum up this error over the entire image, you say whatever PQ values you come up with, they must satisfy this constraint. But we know that this alone is not going to solve the shape from shading problem, right? Because there's not enough constraints in here. So what um, Ikeuchi and Hon did was to add the smoothness constraint. And the smoothness constraint says that the rate of change of these PQ values should be small. We're going to penalize the changes in surface orientation. In doing this, you're tying up the surface orientations of neighboring pixels. And in doing so, you're getting an additional constraint. And so then you take those two factors, you add them up with some weighting function here, and then by using calculus of variations, you can show that you can develop an iterative algorithm that gives you from a single image the PQ values at all points. So here are some uh, examples. This is, these are simple examples, but yet these are pretty impressive results given how uh, under-constrained the problem is. So now, one would imagine that the shape from shading is problem is solved, but I would argue that shape from shading is something that you should use when you have no other avenue. If you've given a, a planetary image which has been taken, you don't have a shot at taking it again, the only way for you to recover shape information might be shape from shading. But if you're talking about industrial automation and you want to measure things with very high precision, this is a risky business. And that was understood in this paper by uh, Bob Woodham. And this is called photometric stereo. How many of you have heard of photometric stereo? Very good. So photometric stereo says, well, this is an under-constrained problem. So how do we crack this problem? Well, we can take multiple measurements. And these multiple measurements are taken using multiple light sources. So unlike stereo or structure from motion, where you're changing viewpoint and you have a correspondence problem, in this case, you don't have a correspondence problem. You're looking at the same pixel, the same scene point, but you change the lighting conditions, right? And so by doing that, when you go back to the reflectance map, you remember the re reflectance maps that I showed you earlier? One brightness value gives you a contour in the reflectance map. So if you have multiple light sources, you have multiple reflectance maps, but the isobrightness contours must all intersect, and at the end of the day, you can get a unique PQ value at each point. Well, it turns out that the simplest case of this is for the Lambertian case. The Lambertian surface is one that appears equally bright in all directions. So here you have I is equal to rho divided by pi. This is called the albedo of the surface times n dot s, which is also what Takeo showed in his slide. This is the angle of incidence, cosine of the angle of incidence. It does not depend on the viewing direction. This is a very special case in the case of photometric stereo. Why? Because now you can take three images under three different lighting conditions. And what Bob Woodham showed is that you have I1, I2, and I3 at each pixel. And you know the source directions S1, S2, and S3. You want to find both albedo and the normal. You can write this in matrix form as follows. So here is your measurement matrix. And here is your known source matrix. And so by simply inverting this matrix, you have the surface normal, this is, you're combining the surface normal and the albedo here into one vector. You can find that uniquely. You take the magnitude of that and you have the albedo or the reflectance of that particular pixel and you also have the direction of the normal vector. Very simple, right? Very elegant. So here are some examples. So these are three images taken from very close by source directions. That's why the three images look almost identical. But from this, you can compute the surface normals. And then you can reconstruct that to get this 3D shape. And you get, uh, as a byproduct, the reflectance of the surface itself. So then people started asking the following question. When does it not work? Right? When does this not work? Well, it doesn't work when? When S is not invertible. Right? You can't invert S. And what does that mean? That means all the light sources and the origin or the place where the object lies, they all lie in the same plane. Well, if that's true, what it means is you can ask further questions like, what are good days for photometric stereo? Because you can take photometric stereo outside. Well, there are certain days of the year when the sun is going to take a trajectory 
where that trajectory and the object are going to lie on the same plane. Those are bad days for photometric stereo. <laughs> but there are good days for photometric stereo as well. So uh, that was the domain of photometric stereo. And I have to tell you that this is very widely used in many different flavors in industrial automation. And the reason is the following. Imagine that you have your iPhone. And in the iPhone, you have a little scratch, right? And you want to measure the scratch using a depth sensor. That would be virtually impossible. You would have to have incredibly high accuracy to measure the scratch. But if you measure it using a surface normal detector like photometric stereo, it would just jump out at you. So that it's a, the, even though it is the derivative of depth, directly measuring it has huge uh, benefits over measuring depth itself. So now, the one drawback here is that you need to know the reflectance properties. right? So from that perspective, there is a paper which is not talked about too much. It was a master's thesis by Silver uh, back in 1980, which talks about how you can use a calibration-based approach for photometric stereo. And the idea is extremely simple. What you do is that imagine that I give you a paint, and the object is, used, is painted with that particular paint. But you don't know the bidirectional reflectance distribution function of that paint. But if you can take the same paint and paint a sphere with that paint, then you can, you've created a calibration object about which you know everything in terms of geometry. So you take the same light sources and you take a bunch of images, but you also know what the surface normal is at every pixel on that uh, sphere. And then you can create a lookup table that just takes you from a k-tuple <coughs> of intensity values to the PQ value on the right-hand side. So if I see any object that's painted with that paint, it doesn't matter what the surface normal is, what the shape is. You can just look up this lookup table and find the surface orientation at each pixel. So here are three images under the same lighting condition, the same paint. And then you get a surface normal map that looks like that. And you get a depth reconstruction right here. And this depth reconstruction actually tells you a lot about why surface normals are important to measure. You see details here which would be very, very hard to measure directly using depth. OK, so that was silver. And then this idea was taken one step further by uh, Hertzman and Seitz. And in this case, what they said is, well, it's not one paint. You might have all kinds of materials, spatially varying reflectance properties on the surface itself. And so what they said is that, well, if you have all the paints that you've used, you can create all these lookup tables. And at each pixel, not only can you ask the question as to what the normal is, you can also figure out what the material is that was used at that point. And that allows you to recover this kind of shape information. OK, but there is one thing that we have swept under the rug here, which is um, uh, interesting, uh, hopefully interesting to you, which is called the interreflection problem. And the interreflection problem is the following. You have this concave bowl here. And if you look at this concave bowl, our assumption is that each point in the bowl is being lit by the light source directly, and that's it. So if you consider this point, of course, it receives light from the light source. But that point is also being lit by all other points on the surface. And we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem here, in the sense that we don't know the shape of the object, so we have no way of estimating what the contribution of all the other points is. Right? So uh, uh, as a first cut at this problem, I'll bring up a paper that I worked on with, with Takeo and with Ikeuchi. Uh, I, I don't think it's kosher to call your own paper a classic. And so I'll just, I'll just say that it is a paper which completes the story. And uh, in this paper, the main result was that if you um, take an object that looks something like this, and you apply photometric stereo to it, you end up getting a shape that looks like this. The shape is always shallower. The reason the shape is shallower is because the, the point is pretending to be a brighter point, which means it's a point that's pretending to, to face the sources more than it actually is. Right? But here's the interesting part. Not only is it shallower, it doesn't matter what light sources were used to capture this information you will always get the same incorrect shape. In other words, this incorrect shape, what we call the pseudo shape, is invariant to the light sources used to capture it. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? So I give you a concave shape. You apply photometric stereo, you get a shape. 
you ship that shape to me and I apply my own photometric stereo, I'll get the same shape. So that gives us hope. That tells us that the pseudo shape perhaps is telling us what the actual shape might be. And it turns out that you can use this should pseudo shape as an initial estimate and then iteratively, iteratively recover the actual shape from it. Okay, so that's the, that's the story of photometry. But since we're talking about photometry, I should also mention a couple of other things that are being widely used in industry. And there's, there's a long ways to go on, on that front as well. And one of them is called light stripe range finding. All of you are familiar with this. By the way, this dates back to the work of Shirai in, in 1972. The idea that you can throw out a plane of light and then capture an image, and each bright point in the image, you have a straight line going through. That's, you have an equation of a ray, and then you have an equation of a plane here. And wherever the ray intersects the plane is where the point exists in the scene, right? We all know this. This is just triangulation. And the problem with light stripe range finding, and this was being used in industry widely from the 70s itself, but the problem was inefficiency. In the sense that, let's say you wanted to do seven stripes here, seven different stripes. Well, if you put all seven stripes at the same time, you're going to get this. But if you take any one point here, it could have <coughs> arisen from any of these stripes, right? Any of these stripes, so it's ambiguous. And so from that perspective, this paper dating back to in 1982 by Postammer and Altshuler was a, a, was a very impressive paper in that it talks about lots of space coding strategies for making this more efficient. These strategies are very common these days, but this was really the first paper that talked about it. The easiest of them being binary coding. All of you are familiar with this. So this is how binary coding works. Let's say you have seven stripes in my example. You can express numbers from one through seven using three bits, right? And then you go to the first bit and you say, I'm going to just turn on all the stripes with ones there. And so you get this image. And then you do the same thing with the second bit and the third bit. So you've captured only three images. And if you go to any given point, let's say this one, it happened to be on in the first image, off in the second, and on in the third, there's only one light source that could have produced, one stripe that could have produced that particular uh, signature, and therefore it's number five. And you can generalize this. You know that two to the power of n stripes, minus one stripes can be done in n images. But if you now go to k array systems, where you're using multiple levels, it's uh, k to the power of n minus one stripes in uh, n images. Okay? So that made light stripe range finding a lot faster and widely used in industry. So this is an example of patterns that are being projected and then finally getting a reconstruction. And then as a last piece, I want to mention uh, a, a piece of technology which is now becoming extremely popular, which is time of flight. And this is a very nice dissertation by Robert Lange, uh, circa 2000 on time of flight imaging. I highly recommend that you uh, look at this particular piece of work because it really gets you into this in, in many different ways. And how many of you are familiar with time of flight? Most of you are. It's a very simple idea, but there are two flavors to this. One is called impulse time of flight. And in impulse time of flight, you throw out a pulse. The pulse hits the scene and comes back. And you measure the, um, the time difference. And then you use the speed of light to figure out where the point lies in the scene. But it turns out that with impulse time of flight, you have to have a pretty strong pulse going out because it's a very tiny pulse. Uh, and you need to have a sensor that is measuring these things very, very fast to be able to detect this. So the more popular method is called continuous wave time of flight, where you modulate the light that's going out, let's say, as a sinusoid. And then that goes out and comes back and you can find the phase difference between the emitted and the received light. And to find the phase difference, it turns out each pixel needs to make three measurements with three different correlations, and you can find the parameters of this sinusoid, and that's then used to compute depth. Well, I mention this because time of flight is producing remarkable results. Uh, here is, um, here is a, a depth map produced by uh, Google's self-driving car. 
uh, or their prototype and you can see the quality of the information. What is ironical here is that this time of flight camera that's sitting here is more expensive than the car, <laughs> right? But this is going to change and this is exactly why I bring this up. Uh, it turns out that, uh, that there are for, for various technological reasons, the price of time of flight has been dropping dramatically maybe not for very long distances but certainly for several meters and in the coming years you should not be surprised to see time of flight cameras on your mobile phone. So what, is, what is their spatial resolution? Well at the moment we're talking about one megapixel images. I mean these are much higher than that because these are scanning systems. But one megapixel one to thirty meter type of data is, is, is now being possible made possible by almost cell phone camera types of form factors. Well, I don't know the numbers, but, but this, is, this is in the, in the works. And so you, if time of flight is going to be on, on, on all your devices, then that could be a, a game changer for vision in general. So uh, with that, I want to wrap up, but I'll just say that uh, this is the area of photometry in vision or physics-based vision, and there are many uh, open problems here. You have uh, scattering of light within media. You have participating media like mm, fog and other things. You have specularities and transparent surfaces. Also objects that have very fine geometric structure. All of these things have been addressed in small ways, but they remain open problems. And so there's lots of exciting work to be done here, but that's it. <laughs>